It's time to go live at Lucian Live 2022 in Denver, Colorado, April 10th through 13th at the Denver Convention Center. Discover the innovative solutions, transformative insights, and strong connections to help you lead through change. Register at elucian.com slash elucian live and catch Elvin and I recording on site live. We can't wait to see all of you. It's time. Welcome back, everybody. Yeah. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited today to be back with, I would say now a long time um, guest co-host of mine. In fact, I think everything in his life now takes a long time. Um, he's, <laughs> he's retired. Um, I think that's his job to be retired. He's recently returned from vacation. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to hit a button here um, called the cheers button, because this is what he's been doing on vacation, Cheers! but I'm going to hit it uh, for as many times as uh, his, he had drinks. And he told me how many drinks he had while he was on vacation. So I've got to hit the button that many times. Cheers! That was, I don't know, like 47 times. Anyway, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bill Pavicello. Bill, what's happening? Hey, Joe. Nice to hear, uh, to be with you back from uh, vacation. And, you know, being retired is is a lot harder than people think, and so you need those vacations. Cheers! And, and your that that cheers the, the number that you had there only took care of the first morning. Um, <laughs> it's always it's always five o'clock someplace, which is another nice thing about being retired. For, for those of you that don't know, the uh, Bill uh, was the former president of the University of Phoenix, and they had at one time Bill what like over five hundred thousand students. And so I like to call him the guru of online learning, which makes every, which means every time he speaks, he gets the gong, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, Bill, we've got an action-packed episode for us today to get to. I'm going to bring in my guests here one at a time. First, his name is Brian Keating. He's director of the Joint Apprenticeship Training Center. Brian, how are you? All right. Good afternoon, Joe. How are you doing? Did you know, Brian, that you were going to get a standing ovation today at this podcast? Well, I certainly hope so. Yeah, well, good. Uh, and secondarily, <laughs> se se what we hope you do too. Uh, lo lots of, uh, lots of uh, people very interested in what you have to say. Um, our second guest with us right now, his name is Kevin Barry. He's Director of Construction at United Service Workers Union. Kevin, how are you? Very good, Joe. Another, another standing ovation for you. Guys, what's going on? We're excited to talk with you. You know, let's take this one at a time. Um, Brian, we'll start with you. What is the Joint Apprentice? Apprent Let me try to try that again. What is the JATC? And what do you do and how do you do it? Uh, the Joint Apprenticeship, the JATC or the JATF, the Joint Apprenticeship Training Center or the Joint Apprenticeship Training Fund, uh, trains uh, construction workers in uh, five different uh, disciplines. Uh, we train in the HVAC industry uh, for service. We train in fire sprinkler, sheet metal worker, fire sprinkler, and in plumbing, uh, as well as steam fitting. And we take uh, applicants who are coming in from the ground level, and uh, we get them employed. And uh, that's where the joint comes in. It's between the employer and between us. Uh, we're doing the technical behind the scenes uh, training and the employer is doing the on-the-job. We don't like to call it on-the-job training any longer. We like to call it on-the-job learning. Um, so the two combinations put together just makes a, an extremely powerful training uh, instrument to educate these uh, men and women on how to uh, do their, their jobs. Success. Yeah, that, that's great. And Bill, I'm going to pass it to you to give me the, the, the first set of questions after I ask Kevin this. Um, Kevin, you're, you're director of construction at United Service Workers Union. Besides the obvious, what is the United Service Workers Union? What do you guys do and how do you do it? Okay, so uh, we are the United Service Workers Union. We're uh, a national uh, union. Um, our international union that we're affiliated is also called the International Union of Journeymen and Allied Trades. We represent roughly amongst everybody about 100,000 people within the United States. And um, we represent everybody from public sector to private sector, um, from construction workers to auto technicians, 
to uh, bus drivers. We do it all. We, we represent and organize in every industry. Bill, I know you find some of this fascinating. I find it all fascinating. Um, you know, it, my background is in, in uh, more traditional higher education. But one of the things that we've seen happening uh, and especially through the pandemic, is that there is a renewed emphasis on what we used to call uh, vocational training, um, training that, that sometimes used to be done at community colleges, but has sort of fallen by the way there. Um, and in, in areas that, um, that you guys are involved in, you know, pipe fitters and plumbers um, and sheet metal workers and HVAC, um, HVAC especially is important out here in Phoenix where I live. And so it's, uh, I, I'm really interested in uh, how you go about doing what you're doing. I guess the first question I'd like to ask is um, how, do you, how do you find students or how do they find you and are there any entry qualifications? Uh, how they find us, uh, we advertise uh, locally as well as through the New York State Department of Labor um, up on their website as well. Um, the New York State Department of Labor has a, an entire list of apprenticeships throughout the state, and they authorize us at certain times uh, to open up enrollment. And it is at that point where we get the influx of applicants coming in uh, to fill out applications. Um, our minimum uh, qualifications are a high school diploma, uh, a GED or a task, and uh, also uh, at least one year of high school algebra um, in order to enter the program. Uh, once they enter the program, then we start to build on those minimum skills. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm interested about the, the high school algebra because I noticed that on your, on your team, you had a picture of an instructor of mathematics. Is, is that person there to, to help fill that gap? That is correct. Um, we have a, uh, from the Suffolk uh, County Community College, uh, we have an, a, one of their uh, instructors uh, who I kind of believe in consistency. So the way I've uh, designed and set up the program is I have uh, the math being taught from day one when you enter the program all the way until you're leaving the program by the same person. Uh, as you, and I don't need to tell you, but uh, a lot of people um, may teach math differently or do math a little differently. And for people who aren't really mathematic or, or mathematicians, I should say, uh, they kind of get lost. So I believe in the consistency of the one instructor taking them from start to finish. Now, being that that instructor doesn't know the particulars of the uh, application of the math to the trade, I also have a trade instructor with that person. And this way they can uh, then take what is being taught on the math side and make it uh, where they can use it on the job site. Excellent. Uh, I've got one more introductory sort of question here and then I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Joe. Uh, how, is, how are these programs funded? Is, do the students pay or is it uh, state supported? No, uh, no. Um, I'll take this one, Brian. Go so ahead. what happens is we are a union. So all of our union employers under their collective bargaining, payment, uh, uh, collective bargaining agreement pay so much an hour for every one of their workers out in the field into our apprenticeship fund. So uh -huh. the more and more contractors that are involved and they get involved because what's lacking out there today is good qualified people. So they wanna get involved with us so they can get good trained people. Not only does Brian have the apprenticeship, but they also do skill improvement classes for guys that might already be journeymen, but a new technique or a new skill or a new um, technology comes out they also come to our school to be educated in that. So it's a uh, it's really a union um, driven collective bargaining agreement that funds this. So it costs the, the young apprentices nothing but maybe a uh, hundred dollars a year for their books and their it's their books to keep. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That is terrific. They, they go to work every day and they work eight hours out in the field and then they come to us uh, at least two nights, sometimes three nights, from six to 10 at night. Wow. On their own time. 
So this is a, attractive for the employer, right? So an apprenticeship program must be attractive to the employers. That's, that's because the employer gets to say, that, and I'm walking through this model and you tell me where I'm off. You know, I want to train my own people, train them the way that, that my organization does something, you know, find people who are interested in this. We, we, you know, fill the gap for us. And then we end up with a trained workforce that knows our business in the way that they need to know our business. Is that, is that the attractiveness um, to the employer? Yeah, well, we, yeah, they would love, they love to have the trained people. That is the key. And it's so hard to find today. So we interview that we have a joint committee, half employers, half the union. Brian chairs the committee when we do all our interviews and everything. And you go through an interview, interview process to get selected to come in. And if you get selected, you get put on a list. You're on that list for two years. And the people of our employers call and say, listen, I'm looking for an apprentice in steam fitting. I'm looking for an apprentice in plumbing, sheet metal. Brian then goes to the list, pulls them from, from the list, sends them to the uh, employer. He interviews them. If he likes them, then he hires them. And that's how it how it goes from there. What's the pipeline of students look like? Um, because, you know, one of the, you know, some of the things you mentioned, like HVAC, fire sprinkler, steam fitting, you know, um, for the average American doesn't know much about this. You have to have a propensity to want to work with your hands, do this really hard work. And, you know, are those types of careers out of fashion in a technology world where there's, you know, where we just, are there I don't know the right way to ask, but there are, are there still lots and lots of students interested in these hands-on, you know, blue collar careers, or is it something that we're having to reconvince students on this model that you can do really well in these careers and that there's a lot of work to be had when in the past, maybe they hadn't thought that. Well, I'm just going to, Brian, I'm going to start and then I'd like you to finish up on the technology and how our training center and the technology that we use because technology just isn't, you know, um, involved with everything but trades. It's so involved now with the trades. I'm going to let Brian talk about that. But um, finding people to come, come to this program, we usually advertise. We get plenty of people to come because it's a union contract. They get fully paid medical for them and their families. They get vacations. They get holidays. They have a retirement program. They have a 401, 401k as well. You know. There's the options for them are unbelievable. We have quite a few people that come to us. They're four year degrees and went out in their fields and decided, you know, this wasn't for me or it wasn't paying enough um, to satisfy them. So they're looking for something different where once you have a trade, you go anywhere in the country and get a job. There's nothing stopping you. There's electricians needed everywhere. There's plumbers needed. There's steam fitters needed. There's tin knockers needed. So that's really the the upside for them. They're working under a union agreement, and um, you know it's it's a really good benefit structure. Yeah, and you know, um, and I know you're going to have Kevin jump in. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, who who is that? that? Brian. Yeah. See, I'm getting you guys mixed <laughs> up because I can't see your faces. That, that's how good I am here on the microphone. Um, but uh, the secondary part of that question that you were alluding toward is that um, we, we had a college president on a while back and he was using the example of, of you know, garbage and being picking up garbage and you don't just go and, and have a, a career like that where you're doing this hard work. It, it takes technology now. Like you're, you've got some oh, yeah. crane that lifts off the garbage truck. You've got to know geometry. There's an iPad controlling it in your car. And that is extended to all trades one way or another. The technology is enhancing the ability to do these trades, whether it's laser pointers that tell you the heat. If you're, I'm, I'm making this up, steam fitting. I mean, I, you, you know, what is the, 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 impact of technology on these careers because it's not just go and learn how to do it anymore it's like you have to know the technology around it too oh uh, absolutely joe and you kind of hit the nail on the head uh the technology especially uh in the trades is is just it's changing every day one of the advantages that we have here at the uh, joint apprenticeship training center is that all of our instructors are actively working in the field um, so they are bringing today's technology to the classroom uh, these are not instructors that, you know, graduated and, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but graduated from college some four, five, six, seven, eight years ago and haven't really been keeping up with the technology or just teaching out of a book. Uh, so as all of this technology keeps flooding in, our instructors are bringing it into the classroom, which is 
is outstanding, outstanding. Um, you know, one of the things I just wanted to back up on real quick, as you had mentioned the employer and Kevin had expounded on that, uh, I also like to point out the fact that when these uh, uh, applicants come into the program, uh, they come in with a job. They come in with all of the benefits that Kevin had already described to you, and they're getting the education, and I'm not a politician, so I won't use the word free, but being paid for by someone else. And all the um, apprentice is required to pay for is his books. Uh, so you're being paid an hourly rate. You have a complete benefit package that is being paid for by the employer, and you're being trained now to become a journey worker. Um, you know, this is just a, a, a career path that, you know, uh, I, to me, and I guess I'm a little prejudiced, but I just think it's absolutely fabulous. Um, the technology in, in the HVAC industry changes. Wow. We have building management systems. Uh, that back in my day, uh, we had people that would go into buildings and turn lights on and start up elevators and turn on the HVAC equipment. That's all being done now by computer. So you need to know how to get into the computer to make sure you're putting out the right temperature, that the door did unlock at 6 a.m. and it did lock at 5 p.m. Lights come on and off, uh, depending on cleaning people, security. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. And the same with all of our other trades. You know, as you've pointed out, we're using lasers, you know, to measure pipe runs. Uh, there's a, a new program out uh, called BIM, uh, Building Imaging Systems, which is a, a 3D model of this building. And we, are, we can now take an entire plumbing system and put it into that 3D image and see how it, how it, how it works. Then we can add the fire sprinkler and see if there's any uh, uh, hits where pipes are hitting other pipes or ductwork or what have you. And For the coordination of trades, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just it's just amazing of, of what's going on out here right amazing. now. Amazing, amazing. You said it. You said it. Somebody said amazing. Yes. That, that sets off the amazing button. You know, one person I'd like to transition here because one person that – um, that is getting up to date on technologies. My co-host, uh, Dr. Bill Puppicello, who's now apparently word on the street here, Bill, is that you may be starting a podcast. I, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, you know, technology continues to advance, my friend. Well, yeah. Well, let me just remind you that at one point I was the president of the, the largest online university in the world, so I know a little bit about technology. Um, <laughs> And well my, said, my dad was, was a master welder a um, okay. hundred years ago. And in those days, you, everything was, as you, you, you mentioned, uh, Brian, on the job training. And that's where he learned his skills. And he, and he learned skills uh, to the point where um, there was a, a leak in a nuclear reactor in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And all of the college trained people couldn't figure out what to do. And they brought my father down and he showed them how to, how to fix it. Um, and it's, it's really encouraging for me to see that there's still that kind of, um, uh, of impetus out there um, in the workforce. But one thing I, I'd like to follow up on, because I, I think that you're, you're both very proud of this, is that... Um, now, there's great quality in your programs, which is proven by the fact that they are accredited. And I wonder if you could just say a few words about the, your, your accrediting body and, and how that speaks to the quality of your programs. Well, there's a, a couple of uh, different uh, accreditations. One is from the uh, United uh, New York State Department of Labor that has certified all of our programs to meet the minimum requirements of the United States Department of Labor. Um, we are also accredited by the NCCER, which is the National Center for Construction, Education and Research. Uh, they are a, a national program out of Florida with over, I think they have about, uh, at this point, I think it's around 100 or 103 uh, different trades. They're very big on the pipeline uh, down south. Um, and uh, we uh, have partnered with them and we are using uh, their curriculum uh, in all of our trades. Um, Bill, you had mentioned welding uh, in our steam fitting program, uh, we have welding and they have an excellent 
um, uh, component for welding. Uh, they teach them, you know, from setting up the machine all the way through, uh, you know, the welding process. Uh, we are uh, also, um, um, I'm authorized by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, to teach the uh, OSHA 10, the OSHA 30. Um, we are very big on safety, as is up here in New York, especially in New York City. I'm authorized uh, also by the New York City Department of Buildings uh, to teach what they have in place they call a site safety training program uh, to ensure that all of these workers that are working um, within the confines of New York City all have these uh, credentials uh, as it pertains to safety uh, so that the workers aren't getting hurt. So the moment our applicants turn into apprentices and come into our program, the very first thing that I personally teach them is the OSHA 30 on how to work safely and what to be looking for and what hazards uh, that we should be looking for. Great. So we, yeah, the, the welding um, came up because I looked at the video on your website and there was there's a spot in there where they're showing the, uh, the welders being uh, being trained. And it just, you know, jogged my, uh, my memory back so quick. Um, you know, one of the other things I noticed, and then I'll, uh, I'll get out of your way, Joe, and you can, uh, you can take over here, is I think there's uh, an underlying uh, concern that, that your institution is, uh, and the whole approach is more than just training. That, you know, you mentioned safety. Um, you mentioned having an optimum working environment for your students. And one of the things that I am particularly impressed by is the fact that you are concerned with green building and carbon footprints. So I wonder if you might say a few words about that. Uh, yes, we, 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 can't, we teach the, uh, the USGBC, the United States Green Building Council. Um, we teach a lot of their information uh, to our students as far as... Um, you know, we're going green. Uh, I think we all know that. Um, and we are headed in that direction. Uh, from everything from prior to building a building, uh, the land that you're going to use, what trees are you going to take down? Uh, how is the building going to be situated in order to face or not face the sun? Uh, what type of uh, high efficiency equipment are you putting into it? Um, what type of light? All of this is, is being taught uh, uh, to our apprentices, as well as um, how do you, if you're demoing a building in today's day and age, or, and I, when I say a building, we do a lot of, uh, where we'll come into an office building and demo a, a tenant space for a new tenant to come in, it has to be rebuilt to their specifications. So when we take out our, our equipment, we're no longer just throwing it in dumpsters to end up in a landfill. It's actually being separated where metals are going to a medical refinery. Uh, where uh, glass is going to a different refinery, if we're taking out any type of uh, housekeeping pads, which are concrete, those are being uh, put in a different dumpster to go out and be recycled uh, so that we are uh, starting to follow along with the USGBC and, uh, and become you know, more conscious uh, you know, of the earth, of the planet, and, and how we are, are we setting up these buildings. Hey, everybody, head over to www.edipexperience.com, our website, where you're going to find all of the episodes that we've recorded categorized so that you can ensure that you're spending your time listening to the podcasts that are most important to you. You're going to see the reviews of our podcasts, the shows in our network, our partners, and a section on starter episodes. If you're new to the Edip Experience, listen to those starter episodes and get a feel for how the podcast has evolved over time and our impact in the world www.edipexperience.com. Well, guys, this has been a great conversation. I do want to uh, interrupt this conversation uh, to play a game because this is just such a serious podcast here at the Edip Experience. We're going to play a little bit of a game called a higher ed word association. Guys, are you ready for this? Sure. Okay. Go. <laughs> for no money. Uh, actually, Bill, you're the only one that doesn't get any money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, 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 just because. Anyway, Can I have bills? Get, uh, what's that? Can I have bills? <laughs> yeah, you could have bills. And Bill doesn't need anything. He's had plenty Cheers. of those on vacation. <laughs> um, so listen, guys, I'm going to give you a word or a phrase, and I want you to uh, respond to it with the first group of thoughts that come to your head. And, and oh, we'll God. do this. At, 
Brian, you'll go for the first two. You'll go first. And then in Bella, you get to go too. And then Kevin, you get to go on the last two first. Okay, ready? Okay. Here we go. Brian, college degree. Uh, useful. Kevin, college degree. Uh, sometimes not for everyone. Bill, college degree. It's something that's being uh, reconsidered right now for its value uh, in education in general. And I think uh, saying it's probably not for everyone is spot on. Who's the academic of you three? Uh, the academic always goes longer, just for the record, answers longer. <laughs> that's, that's rude. <laughs> well, Bill, you know, where's my gong button? Uh, two, Brian, number two, student debt. Um, uh, student death, uh, debt, uh, here, uh, non-existent. Kevin, student debt. Outrageous. And we should be looking at a better way to have our young people get an education. Bill, student debt. Out of control. And that's all I'm going to say. Hey, <laughs> Bill, we want you to go. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Kevin, you get to go first. Future of work. Technology driven. Uh, Brian, future of work. Uh, in the trades. Absolutely in the trades. Bill, future of work. Completely change because of the pandemic mm, good answers you guys all right kevin last one blue collar my roots where i come from brian blue collar yeah i gotta go with kevin bill blue collar the undergirding of the united states well there you have it ladies and gentlemen this has been another episode of higher ed word association what'd you guys think of that kind of fun right yeah, yeah it was Definitely. Right, good. We need you know, a better. Are, uh, we need a better host, though. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a I second. I knew you were saving up for that, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, where's my mute button for Doctor Bill Pepitello? Um, guys, the the apprenticeship model is one that is uh, continually discussed within higher education. In fact, there's a a guy out there that writes about apprenticeships really being, you know, full cycle. There used to be apprenticeships back in the day, and then everything kind of shifted to formal education, and now apprenticeships are coming back. Can you talk about interest? You talked about that you'd have no problem getting students interested, but what are the questions like? You know, do students say, is it a, is it a question of, should I go to college or should I do an apprenticeship? Is it is it, should I do an apprenticeship or should I go to a non-credit program to get these skills? How does the, the apprenticeship model communicate to a student? Well, when I talk to uh, high school students and I'm trying to get to the guidance counselors because this is not really being offered, at least not in these parts, um, as a career path. It's mentioned briefly, uh, but a lot of the students that I talked to had no idea that this existed. Um, and they would have opted for this uh, as opposed to going to a two or a four year college and taking on all of that debt that we just spoke about uh, a few moments ago. Um, so I think we're doing a, a, a terrible disservice to the young people by not offering this as a career path, a legitimate career path. Yeah, that's interesting, Bill. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, as you know, Joe, I've been around for a while. And um, in, in one of my sub careers, I worked at a, uh, at a teaching hospital in Philadelphia. And in those days, all of the, the, the healthcare technicians um, were required to do an apprenticeship. And it was, you know, it, it was just a, a normal part of uh, of the programs there. And then it sort of just sort of dwindled away. Um, I think part of it was as the, uh, the four year degree sort of became the gold standard and people forgot about uh, the trades and, and their value. So it's, 
um, it, it, for me, I agree completely that it, it ought to be part of what guidance counselors are um, are talking about in high schools. And you know, even in, in college, um, I have a granddaughter who, when she graduated high school, came to me and, and said, Grandpa, I don't, I don't think I wanna go to, to the college right away. And I said, well, what do you wanna do? And she said, well, I'm gonna work. I wanna, I wanna find out what I like, what I wanna do, and then maybe I'll, I'll think about going to college to, to pursue that. And you know, it's exactly what she did. Um, she went into the, into the food industry of all places, but decided that she really liked management in that area. And so now she's ready to go to college. And I think that's, you know, rather, you know, you mentioned, uh, you guys mentioned that sometimes somebody with a four-year degree comes back and says, you know, I can, I can be more productive in the trades. I think it, that works both ways because somebody can get into the trades and say, wow, you know, the trades are a pathway to something else, but maybe I need a certificate or a degree to, 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 to a better myself in that way. So I, I think you're spot on. Guys, what do you think about what, what do you think about in terms of unions, you know, in terms of the unionizing of these employees? How important is the union to protection of these careers, of these people, of these employees, of the work itself? Well, listen, unions are the backbone. And um, we're the blue collar people. We're the ones paying the taxes to support the country. We're out there every day. And as long as unions don't lose their way, I was with a traditional building trades union prior to coming with the union I'm with now. And some people become, they have to realize they work for their employer. They don't work for the union. The union is the people that come in and negotiate their, their benefit package and their contract every three years. And that the employer who's employing them and signing their checks every day are the people that they have to work hard for. I know when I came to this union, I was with the electricians union, IBW for 18 and a half years, and they, everybody was relying on the union for their job because they had a hiring hall. Um, when I came here and we started these apprenticeship programs 22 years ago, um, we, we have our guys that work for their employers. And I tell them, listen, you're a member of the union, but you work for your employer. And the harder you work and make that employer money, the more we're able to ask for a contract time, the more jobs he's going to get. So we're productive. We have to be the best we're out there. When I organize a new company, I always tell them, don't think because you become a union member now that you're going to slack or, or, you know, you know, these mantras that people put out there that, oh, you're in the union. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. I said, you got to work twice as hard now because you're union. So I think the union is the key way to go for people that, um, you know, when I was a young man, my father was electrician. My grandfather was drove a train and they always wanted me to go to college. And then I got to the point where I graduated high school and you know what, I, I, that wasn't my thing, but they always wanted us to do better than them. And now everybody thinks they need to go to college. And you know what, that's not the case. The trades is a good, hardworking, satisfying industry. Well, I'll take it from somebody who uh, was the champion of the four-year degree. There are a lot of people in the trades making more money than people with a college degree right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the exception to that rule, but uh, I think you're exactly right. People are getting into that a new appreciation of, uh, of what it means, not just the to have a college degree and its value, but uh, you know, what is a satisfying career? And I think you know, I, we have people who who come and help service us, um, plumbers in particular, because it's we get some rough uh, weather and conditions out here in the desert. And you know what? Those people are they're hardworking. They love what they're doing. And tell I can tell you from the bills I get, they're making a, a good living. <laughs> You know, the other part of that, though, is, is to your point, Kevin, when you when you when you think about this, you, you don't understand the full impact of uh, people in trade careers until you need someone to fix something that's broken and you can't get anyone. 
And I, yeah. the case in point, I was in, I, I've, I spent the last four years in California. I'm transitioning now in my new role at Lindenwood University out uh, to St. Louis. But while I was in California and our your renters and our fridge broke and they said they couldn't get out uh, a technician uh, to fix a refrigerator for us for three weeks. And I said, are you kidding? And you take that example and you apply it to all the careers, uh, you know, HVAC or whatever, and you can't get people to do this work anymore because there's so much demand and not enough supply. Yeah. And you look at some of these young people that come into trade, there's guys I went to apprenticeship program with that are very, very successful electrical contractors today. You know, they took it to that next step, you know, and they, they became great, great. They weren't just great electricians. They became great businessmen too. Yeah. So it, it's, 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 you can do whatever you want. It's just hone your trade, learn your skill and be the best at it. Bill, do you have any further questions for our gentleman today before I wrap it up? Well, of course I do. I always have further questions. <laughs> oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> you know, we've been talking about technology. Um, and so in that regard, I just wondered, is, is there any component to your hands-on programs that is online or sort of distance education? Uh, at this time, I am not doing uh, any of my training online. Um, it has been offered by OSHA. It also has been offered by the New York City Department of Buildings uh, for the site safety training I mentioned earlier. Uh, the NCCER also has some. Um, I'm kind of old school. Uh, I'm teaching you a trade, uh, and I try to assault your senses uh, when you're <laughs> from, uh, from the uh, auditory, the visual, the tactile learner, uh, and I can't do that online. I need to put a valve in your hand so you can see how that valve works. Uh, I need to, if I'm going to teach welding, very difficult to teach you welding uh, <laughs> you know, via a Zoom. Uh, <laughs> be here. I need you to touch it. I need you to see it. If I'm teaching ladder safety, I need you to get on and off that ladder under my uh, expert eye so that I can see that you're actually using that tool correctly. So right. I'm, I'm not a big fan at this point, Bill, uh, uh, of doing online, even during the pandemic. Uh, I steered away from it. Uh, I was shut down for about uh, four and a half months and then came back with a vengeance and, uh, and we caught up. The guys came in extra and we caught up on our time and our, on our schedules and and got where we needed to be. Wow. Well, I can tell you as a person who receives those services that I want the guy who's coming to, to provide that service to me to know how to do it hands-on. So <laughs> I- Well, absolutely. As, as Joe just mentioned a, a minute ago, we had a refrigerator. You have no idea the technology that these new refrigerators are <laughs> inside of them you know, compared to the older refrigerators. I mean, so these technicians, they have to be trained. And you can't do it on a Zoom because, again, you yourself know people get interrupted at home, the doorbell rings, the phone goes off, the neighbor's dog is barking, and your t attention is no longer on the lesson. So you miss yeah. who, who puts it on mute, goes into the bathroom, comes back, goes get yeah, a snack. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, so, you know, with this as it is I here, miss something. you're in front of me. I can see when your head goes down and you look at your phone you know, and I come flying across the classroom, you know, so, you know, Yikes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one, Joe. That was a good one. So again, it's, it's, I think it's important to have that, that uh, in-person training. Couldn't agree more. Okay, Joe, I know you, uh, you want the attention, so I'll throw it back. <laughs> <laughs> Bill you used to your your button used to be the gong and it was actually named Bill so every time I would hit it the gong would go off but I mean, this is the Bill button <laughs> anyway guys we like to wrap up our episodes with the last uh, with fi the final two questions we ask every single guest and and I want to give you guys enough time um, enough time to 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 do them uh, Brian we'll start with you um, what didn't we say about uh, JATC that you would like to say events you have going on, the website, uh, anything that you wanted to say that maybe we didn't get to, so kind of like take your take your plug, opportunity to plug what you do to the audience. Same thing for you, Kevin. And then um, what do you see as the future of higher education? So what didn't we say about JATC? What didn't we say about USWU? And, you know, so you can go one at a time. And what does the future of higher education look like? And uh, Brian, we'll start with you. 
Well, uh, from my standpoint, uh, we covered a, a great deal uh, in, a, in a half an hour for the uh, Joint Apprenticeship Training Center. Um, and everything that I put out there, you know, our website uh, is, will be updated within the next month or so. So if you're up there now, please revisit us uh, in about a month as we uh, will be uh, uh, kind of renovating that, if you will. Um, and again, uh, this is a, an opportunity for a young person to, and I, I, I don't have Alzheimer's, I know I keep repeating myself, but a career path. It's extremely important to get that out there. It's a career path um, that we want to offer uh, to the younger people, to the younger generation that's come in. It's not a job. And as Kevin alluded to earlier uh, uh, in this podcast, when he said that there's a committee that gets together both union and employer and interviews these people, they look for that word. They look for the word, I'm looking for a career. Not I, I need a job uh, because a, this is a real commitment. You have to remember, this is a four and five year commitment, not only that you're making, that your family's making. You know, mommy's not at the dinner table or daddy's not at the dinner table two nights a week because he's here bettering his uh, uh, skills in order to better his family life as well. So, and if you don't have the website, it's www.jatf.uswu.net. Uh, Kevin, we'll go to you. What do we need to say about well, listen, uh, go for I, it? I, yeah, we, you know, I'm a union guy, born and raised that way. That's how I was put clothes on my back. That's how fed me as a kid. And, you know, I went to the same career. I went a little bit different. My father stayed electrician. I you know, became an officer of the union. I became a delegate. I made a switch and came over to this union. And I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm getting toward the tail end of my career. And looking back... It was probably one of the best careers I've ever had. I mean, my kids will tell you as we pass a stadium or a building, if we're going into New York City or we're going somewhere, and I go, oh, did I, did I tell you guys I worked on this job? Yes, Dad, we know. They actually, before we get there, <laughs> they say, hey, Dad, there's the job you worked on now, and they roll their eyes. But it's a fulfilling, great experience. And as I get, like I said, as I get toward getting closer to retirement here, I look at my accounts my annuity fund, my uh, pension, my 401k. I remember being a young man and being on the negotiating committee for the first time. And I'll mention this guy's name. His name was George Martin. He was a seasoned electrician. And we, we were sitting down discussing on the union side what we need. And we said, listen, I was a young guy. We need more money in our envelope. And George Martin said, Kevin, we understand. We're going to put some money in the envelope. We're going to put it in retirement. And he says, you're not going to understand that point now but believe me i understand it we need to do this for the younger people and as i'm getting closer to retirement i'm i'm not going to have a worry in the world because thank god that the union funds did well made great profits you know over the years in the market and this and that and i know looking back i did never save that type of money on my own because as you know we all go through life i put two girls through college already everything else that goes along, you know, something breaks something you would dip into something, that money, it was the best experience. And it, it was a great union career for myself and the retirement aspect, the healthcare, it's, it's been an amazing run. You know, one thing we didn't say that I think it, that we should all, all recognize. And, uh, you know, and when I say we all listeners, all of us, that the, 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 blue collar, hard working folks that we're talking about that are a part of JATC and United Service Workers Union. When coronavirus, not when, while coronavirus has been happening, these are frontline people. These are people, you know what, because when something breaks and you need somebody to come and fix it, it's not like you can wait a month and see what happens with coronavirus if your heating goes out. You need to get your heat fixed. That, and that, I think that's, that's something that needs to be said. Would you guys agree? Yeah, no, Absolutely. definitely. A construction in the state of New York was considered essential. Our guys went to work every day. They got the virus, they got better, and they came back. We represent 30,000 home health care workers. They don't have a choice. They got to get up every day and go to work. You know, we're very, very fortunate. Our auto technicians also deemed essential. Home, the home heating fuel industry deemed essential. There wasn't very many of our guys that were out of work for uh, you know, too long because it was essential. We Everybody had to get to work. Yeah, there you go. Bill, what do you think about that? 
Uh, absolutely right. I mean, we uh, everyone saw the the effects of of the pandemic and and you know what the frontline people in various careers had to do. But you know, you're absolutely right. There are there are folks who don't have a choice. And you know, I for one appreciated um, knowing that those people were out there on the front line. I mean, I, you know, we we should not forget that going forward because as we start to get back to normal, um, I think people need to keep that you know front of mind that who got us through uh, some of the hardest times. Correct. Well, there you go, guys. Uh, this has been another episode of the Edup Experience. First, I want to thank my guest co-host, uh, the esteemed Bill of Pepe, Dr. Bill Pepicello. Always good to have you here, my friend. Always good to be with you, Joe. Appreciate it. And uh, this was a great uh, conversation, Kevin and Brian. Terrific. Thanks. Yes, Bill, it was I a really pleasure meeting you. Well. All yes, right, my I guest. I really enjoyed it. My guest, uh, Brian Keating, he's director of the Joint Apprenticeship Training Center. My second guest, or my 1A guest, 1 and 1A, Kevin Barry, he's director of construction at United Service Workers Union. There's the standing ovations you guys deserve. Guys, I got to tell you, on all the 399 episodes that I've done, I got to tell you, this is like one of my top five uh, conversations. I, I just love hearing about the hard working of people and the hard work ethic of people in the U.S. and and the great work that we do and appreciate what both of you do to keep the uh, engine running, as it were. Oh, thank, thank you very you much. Very much. It's a pleasure. That. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just had up. It's time to go live at Lucian Live 2022 in Denver, Colorado, April 10th through 13th at the Denver Convention Center. Discover the innovative solutions, transformative insights, and strong connections to help you lead through change. Register at elucian.com slash elucianlive and catch Elvin and I recording on-site live. We can't wait to see all of you. It's time. <laughs>